Hi everyone, Mary here, and we are going to spend a little time talking about kinematics. Now, kinematics is defined as the study of how things move. Um, the word kinema is an old Greek word that means movement or motion. Um, a couple places where you've heard it is perhaps if you were in Europe, you would go to the cinema instead of going to the movie theater. Uh, kinesiology is the study of human movement. And eventually in this course, we're going to talk about kinetic energy. And kinetic energy is the energy an object has due to its motion. So in kinematics, we are going to talk about how things move. This is a beautiful way to start physics, um, describing motion. Now, the gentleman who was the first big scientist to do an awful lot of kinematics was Galileo Galilei. And Galileo Galilei, he lived in the 1600s in Italy, and he was the, one of the very first people to quantitatively describe motion. So quantitatively, if you remember, is data that involves numbers. And he looked at speed, time, velocity, distance, acceleration, did a lot of experiments to actually gather some data. And before we can talk about cars and rockets and all sorts of other things, we have to be able to describe motion. And we're going to do that in kinematics. Now, dynamics is why things move, what makes an object begin moving and what makes that object stop moving. And we're going to do that later in the course. But so right now, we're going to talk about the work of Galileo and the concept of kinematics. We're going to start with one-dimensional motion. If you remember from math classes, um, very often there are three dimensions. Well, not very often. There are three dimensions. Um, there is the horizontal back and forth motion, there is the up and down motion, and there is the in or and out motion. And these are represented by the x, y, and z coordinate systems that you use in math. Physics can describe motion in all of those various dimensions, but we're going to start with something that is very, very simple, and that is one-dimensional motion. So one-dimensional motion is, means any kind of motion that occurs in a straight line. And it might sound kind of boring to begin with, but it's a beautiful place to start. So what are we talking about if we're talking about straight line motion? A sprinter that's going in a straight direction. A car that's in a drag race and only going in one direction. When you drop an object down, or if you throw an object up into the air, all of those are one-dimensional motion. And then later in subsequent lessons and chapters, we're going to talk about two-dimensional motion, objects that are moving through space while they're going, for example, like up and down. But that's later. So we're going to start out with one-dimensional motion or one-dimensional kinematics. Before we do that, we have to have a few definitions that are in common so that we're all using the same words. One is the definition of distance and how that compares and contrasts to the definition of displacement. Distance is a common English word that I'm sure you are familiar with. And distance is the total length of the path followed. Now that's the physics definition of distance. In equations and things in physics, we typically use lowercase d to represent, represent distance. And in some textbooks, you may in your past have seen even uppercase d used for distance. Why we're going to mention it here is because distance is something very, very different from displacement. Displacement is defined as the difference between the beginning and the ending portions of a path. So let's go over here and take a look. If I have somebody who's going for a walk and they start here and they walk all the way around this, this lake or park or whatever you talk about, um, the entire path that they travel, that's the distance they have traveled. The displacement is from there where they begin to where they end. Now, in physics, we need both pieces of information. If you are concerned about how many steps you are going to get on your little pedometer as you're out for this walk, well, total distance is going to contribute to that. But if you want to just know where you begin versus where you end, then we talk about displacement. Here's another example. Um, if someone is on a running track or a sports, a 
track and field track. If they start here and go all the way around, often these are quarter mile tracks, so if they go all the way around, their, dis their distance traveled is a quarter mile. But if they start here, go all the way around and end here, what is their displacement? Well, their displacement happens to be zero because they begin and they end at exactly the same point. Both are useful in physics, both distance and displacement. So that's one of those words that we all have to be careful of as we describe motion. Now what's the difference between distance and displacement? One is a scalar and one is a vector. And in physics we're going to have both of these. We're going to have scalars and we're going to have vectors. A scalar is a number or quantity without a direction associated with it. A vector is some sort of a number with direction associated with it. Let me give you an example. Let's say you're in your car and I say I want you to drive a distance of 50 miles. So you start here, X marks the spot, you're going to start right here, and you drive 50 miles. Well that means in you're going to drive 50 miles, but where does that mean you're going to finish? You could finish exactly where you started. You could go around the same block dozens of times in order to achieve your 50 miles, or you could maximum be 50 miles away from the place that you started. The 50 mile distance, you're going to need so much gasoline to run your car, but it doesn't give us an awful lot of detailed information about where you begin and where you end, because you could be in all sorts of different places. If I say drive a displacement of 50 miles west, well, if you start right here and you go 50 miles straight west, shoop, you are going to be exactly 50 miles to the west of the place that you start. If I say drive 50 miles north, from your starting position, you're going to go 50 miles north of where you begin. So this is a lot more specific, um, and we tend to use vectors more than scalars often in physics, and it's due to the level of predictability um, of where something's going to begin and where something is going to end. When you have a vector, you have to indicate the direction that it's traveling because a vector is a number with direction. So how do you indicate direction? Sometimes it's simple. It could be as simple as saying an object's going up or down. Um, sometimes it is good enough to describe an object as moving to the left or to the right or maybe forward or backwards. If you're a pilot flying an aircraft, you better have a good idea what direction you're traveling. When you're out for a walk, maybe north, south, east, west works. But if you're piloting an aircraft a, a long way on a long cross country or something, you're going to be following some sort of a compass heading. And so direction is important so that we know where we're beginning and where we are actually ending. Often in this class, we're just going to use a positive or a negative sign to indicate direction. If you remember from your past mathematical classes you've taken, um, very often if you have a number line, numbers in one direction are going to be in a positive direction. Numbers in the negative direction are going to have, or in the opposite direction, will have a negative value. And so often we're going to just indicate the direction part of a vector by saying it's positive or negative motion. And don't worry about this yet. When we start solving problems and doing throwing some math on this, you, the person doing the calculation, are the one who determines which direction is positive and which direction is negative. So some examples of scalars and vectors. Remember, scalars are, th are quantities that we measure that do not have a direction associated with them. So for example, distance. Um, this car has traveled a distance of not quite 100,000 miles on its odometer. There's no direction on this odometer saying this car has traveled 100,000 miles north, south, east, or west. It's just total distance it's traveled. Mass. If I say my cat has a mass of 6 kilograms, that 
it would be silly to say my cat has a mass of six kilograms west. That would be just plain kind of goofy and wouldn't sound right. Volume, a gallon of milk. Um, energy, maybe I've got 300 kilocalories of energy in this candy bar. It would not make any logical sense to say that's up, down, north, or south. So there's an awful lot of quantities that we measure without direction. Now, some things have direction, um, and of course, those are vectors. Displacement, we talked about displacement. Force, when you push on an object, you push in a certain direction. Um, when you step on the accelerator in gas, in, uh, in the gas pedal on your car, when you step on the accelerator, it's nice when you know the direction you are accelerating. It would be kind of annoying if it was a surprise every time you stepped on that accelerator. Um, when a football player like Clay Matthews here tackles somebody, he's got momentum, which is a combination of mass and velocity, and it's moving in a certain direction. So vectors have direction, scalars do not, and we will use both. All right, that will do for this one, and we'll see you next time. Thanks. Bye.